up next on Walking by Faith. What we do tend to do is instead of looking to God sometimes, what we'll do is we'll look to the people that are the closest to us or the person. And we think, what's wrong with my spouse that they aren't fulfilling me, that they aren't making me happy. But marriage will not make you happy. What you should do is get happy and get content and then bring somebody else into your happiness and contentment. I want to welcome you to Walking by Faith today. So glad that you're with us. Today we're starting a new short series of messages on Samson. We're simply calling this Lessons from Samson. And today we're going to begin with Samson's life as a young man. Now, you probably know about this young man. You know, we talk about Samsonite luggage. I mean, it's the toughest. And Samson was the strongest man that had ever lived. And God supernaturally gave him strength. And he had tremendous potential. He was anointed by God, he was called by God, he was blessed by God, but yet he wasted the potential that he had and Dylan did not fulfill God's purpose and destiny for his life. And it starts out with a small problem that he has with his eyes, a small problem of lust. As a young man, probably 20 years old, he takes a jog one afternoon over to the city of Timnath, some five miles from home, and sees a girl and says to his parents, I saw this girl in Timnath, get her for me as a wife. Now the issue is that she is a Philistine. She she is on the other side of the national border. She worships a god named Dagon, a male mermaid. And his parents say, isn't there anyone in all of Israel who you could marry? And and of course, he says, she looks good to me. I think we all know it takes more than she looks good to have a great marriage. And uh, we're going to be talking today about how to find a mate, how to have a great marriage. And I want you to come with us right now as we go into this talk. Today, we're starting a series, small series on lessons from Samson. Today, I want you to listen to this, especially all you single people. This is for you how to choose a spouse, and how to be a good choice. We're going to start in Judges 14 with verse 1. Remember Samson, uh, before he was born, the angel appeared to his parents and said about him that he is going to be a special child. He was to be a Nazarite from his mother's womb. In other words, he was to drink no wine, couldn't have anything that came from the grape, no raisins, Uh, anything like that, couldn't cut his hair. And God blessed him, called him, gifted him to him, anointed him, but he never reached his full potential. Uh, With Samson, he's one of the people where most of the lessons that we learn from him are what not to do. All right, but there's quite a few of them. We're going to be looking at them. All right, Judges 14, 1. One day when Samson was in Timnath. Now, he noticed a certain Philistine woman. How many of you have ever noticed somebody of the opposite sex? You know, come way back. <laughs> you're not lifting your hand, you're dead. <laughs> All right. Okay. When he returned home, he told his father and his mother, I want to marry that young Philistine woman I saw in Timnath. Now, you know, when you, he, he has seen her, he has not even talked to her. How many of you know your mind can build, yet can build you a person? I mean, you think you know all about them, and you've never even talked, you've just seen them. And you think they're this, and they're this, and they're this, and they're the next thing. You've never seen them. Now, the custom in that day was that the parents would arrange the marriage. And may I just say this? I am convinced that is a great tradition. (laughs) I, I wish we did it that way. However, here in the West, we don't. Although most of the world, may I say, still does. All right, verse 3. His father and mother objected strenuously. Isn't there one woman in our tribe or among all the Israelites that you could marry? Why must you go to the pagan Philistine and find a wife? But Samson told his father, get her for me. She's the one I want. One translation says, she looks good to me. How many of you know that that looks good stuff? It doesn't last. I used to have a lot of hair. This church cost me my hair. <laughs> How many of you, you know, you get, you get older men, you tend to get furniture disease, and your chest moves into your drawers, and uh, 
Things just move around, and Jeannie told me I couldn't say anything about ladies. <laughs> if, I want, if I wanted this place to stay tonight, I had to be good. All right. Proverbs 19 and 14. Houses and riches are inheritance from parents, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. You know, when the, the hardest time in your entire life to hear God is when you are single and you are thinking about getting married. It is the hardest time to hear God because you are emotionally involved. There is physical attraction. And a lot of times people think God said, but it was just their hormones that said. All right? It is a very difficult time to hear God. So the first thing that you need to do is pray. Pray, pray, pray. But prayer is not enough in this case. You need to pray and fast. You say, why do you need to fast? Because after about three days, your body will shut up. All right? And uh, you, you can begin to hear God. One of the things that, that Samson did do right was he consulted his parents. You know, when it's time to get married, it's good to get advice. It's good to get counsel. Uh, ask someone else about your, your perspective uh, spouse or this prospective person that you're considering becoming engaged to. The Bible says, Proverbs 18, he who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. Now notice there is a finding, there is a pr finding process. It is not just lock yourself away in your, in your room and read your Bible and God's going to bring that person to you. There is a finding process. So we want to talk to you, just give you some, uh, some biblical counsel today about finding a spouse or finding or choosing a good, a good spouse and becoming a good choice. Number one is no missionary dating, right? No missionary dating. Second Corinthians 6, 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness, what communion has light with darkness. Saying when you are considering someone, you must only consider believers. Doesn't matter how handsome he is. Doesn't matter how beautiful she is. Doesn't matter how rich they are. If they're not a believer, God says no. In 1 Corinthians 15, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, it says that you may marry whomsoever you will, but only in the Lord. Or they have to be a believer. Love the same God, want to serve God with the same fervor that you have for God. Right? Now, I want to put to, to, to rest the myth that there is just one person in the whole world that you can marry. Right? The Bible does not teach that. In fact, again, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 says, you may marry whomsoever you will, but only in the Lord. If there was just one person for you, God would not have said whomsoever you will. Uh, in fact, if you look at your Bible, there is only one person that God told them, there was only one person that they could marry, and that was Adam. <laughs> All right, that was Adam. That was it. That was it. The, other, the only other example that even comes close to that is Hosea. And uh, through some circumstances, God told Mary, uh, Hosea excuse me, to go and marry a prostitute. And he didn't tell him which one. He just says, go find one. Just go find one and marry one. God did not say even which one. But uh, when, you, when you begin, the, the foundation is this. Only consider someone that is a believer. It's really easy to um, have that desire to reach out and, and influence other people. And that's what, uh, as Christians, we want our light to shine. And there's nothing wrong with letting your light shine. Uh, but with someone of the opposite sex, you, you have to be careful and guarded and not um, go in the process of... Um, dating and planning for a future together. I think uh, sometimes we trip and fall into this real easily because, well, like as a girl, if the, a guy notices you, and you, it's really easy to think, 
wow, he must be wonderful because he noticed me <laughs> and asked me out. And you know, and, and you can just paint him to be the picture that you want him to be and overlook, um, well, yeah, but you know, he doesn't go to church and he doesn't do this and he, and he has these, but, um, but he noticed me. And so um, we have to be careful and guard our hearts and, and know, you know what? If we're going to want a great marriage in the future, we've got to be going the same direction and um, serving the same God. If we're going to be a team, we've got to be the same, go the same direction. And, and God, is, God isn't trying to um, stifle you, but he's trying to protect and he, he loves you and knows what will really be the best for you. So know that you can trust God and his instructions. <laughs> When you're looking, look for someone who forgives quickly, right? Somebody who forgives very quickly. If they have issues with unforgiveness, you need to run. The Pharisees are talking to Jesus about marriage and about divorce. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, because of the hardness of your hearts, he said, Moses permitted you to divorce your wife, but from the beginning, it was not so. So Jesus said that divorce has to do with hardness of heart. Now, when the Bible kind of defines tenderheartedness, which is the opposite of having a hard heart, this is what it says in Ephesians 4, verse 32. It says, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Now, when it talks about what is a tender heart, it says someone who forgives, someone who's kind, someone who forgives. Now, this is how it works. Listen, it is impossible to live with somebody 24-7, 365, and not have them say or do something stupid. I, right? I, did, I did that <laughs> yes, last you did. night, the night before last. The night before. Yeah. Oh, I love you. forgave you. me. I did. Now, it, if... If, if they do not forgive, right? The, Jesus said this, forget, unforgiveness is the number one sign of a hard heart. And that hard heart will ultimately destroy a marriage. You know, if you forgive and just keep on forgiving, you will fall in love with the same person a thousand times and have a great marriage. But if you do not forgive, ultimately, there is a divorce court waiting for you downtown. Jesus said, it is because of the hardness of your hearts that you divorce each other. It's because you do not forgive. The thing of it is this, if they don't forgive somebody else, they're not going to forgive you. You need to find someone who is quick to forgive. Then do not marry in a wave of sexual desire. Now, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 again, it says it's better to marry than to burn. But if you look at the context, it's talking about two believers that are considering marriage. And it says, don't just sit there and burn. It says, get married, get married. But it's not just saying, just because your hormones are going crazy, get married. In fact, uh, let me say this. When, it was, when, it's, when it's really saying in 1 Corinthians 7 is this. It's saying don't have a super long engagement. Okay? Do not have a super... You know, we know people who've been engaged for five years. And I'm like, I want to slap you. You know? Let me just say this. It is really hard to stay pure when you're in love and you've expressed your love and you've expressed your commitment to somebody for five years. It's very hard. Now, here's what happens, and this, this, this destroys somebody's heart or it destroys a relationship, right? When, when, a, when two people that are not married get involved physically, you got, we're talking about believers. Now, listen, girls, this is, this is what happens every time, right? If the couple gets involved physically, immediately, instead of completing the man, you are competing for the man's heart with God. You're competing for that other person's heart. They want to follow God. They want to stay pure. But now there's this, this physical relationship, and as uh, 
Someone said not too long ago, you know, when you have premarital sex, you get stupid. You just lose all your good sense. But here's what, here's what happens. So then all of a sudden, you are competing with God instead of completing the man or the woman in God. You're competing. So one of two things happens. Either they compromise and their, their, their fellowship with the Lord is broken, or they turn away from you and pursue God. Either way, you lose. It's really important to keep yourself pure. I just want to say something about where you date. Because there are things that you do that don't help you get to know that person at all. And you know, if you just spend uh, your only dating time is going to uh, movies, um, there's a lot you, you don't learn about about the people. I'm just saying, you know, there's some good places to find their character. And you won't even know what kind of character to look for if you're not looking in the Word of God to see what God-like character is like. And that is huge. If um, you want to find a good partner to seek God, to be a person of the Word, so um, many character things that you might not have even seen in your home, but the Word reveals it to you, uh, shows you what you know, a prudent wife is from the Lord. That what is a prudent wife? Someone who can look ahead and see the consequences of their choice. And if you read your proverb tomorrow, Proverb 5, it actually has a description where the dad is saying to the son, pay attention, here's some wisdom for you. And he says, you know, the lips of an adulteress drip honey and her speech is smoother than oil. And he goes on to describe that she talks sweet and then turns around and it is poisonous. And you can tell that when, you know, the guy talks really nice and re to his mom and dad and then turns around and bad mouths them and tells, you know, says how bad things about them or, or their friends. And then it talks about the feet, what direction their feet are headed, that you can see, um, you know, what direction they're going there. It, it, the word is going to make a difference um, if you feed on the word and know what the word says. Mm -hmm. Do not marry to escape problems and tension. If, if you're lonely before you get married, you're going to be lonely afterwards. If you're depressed before you get married, you will be clinically depressed after you get married. <laughs> if you are unhappy before you get married, you will be depressed when you get married. Married, right? Marriage was not designed to meet all of your needs. If that was the case, you wouldn't need God. What we do tend to do is instead of looking to God sometimes, what we'll do is we'll look to the people that are the closest to us or the person. And we think, what's wrong with my spouse that they aren't fulfilling me, that they aren't making me happy? But marriage will not make you happy. What you should do is get happy and get content and then bring somebody else into your happiness and contentment, all right? Because marriage will magnify where you are. I, I like to see it like kind of like a triangle with God at the top. And um, here's the boy, here's the girl. And as if they're both seeking God and learning and growing, to, wanting to serve God and please God and, and seek after his word and his ways, the closer they get to God, the closer they get to each other. Whereas if they like... God, I got to put you on hold. I got to find me a spouse. And so then they're going and chasing after, go, pursuing each other. And, and uh, what you do find is going to end up being far away from God. Okay. Here's, a, here's a great one. This is, this is so important. You need to find out how the two of you handle disagreements. Some people are quiet and won't talk. Others yell and scream and threaten. Others walk out. You know, you get somebody that will not sit down and talk and discuss and pray. Uh, you get somebody who's yelling and threatening, run! Just run. Because you will have many, many, many disagreements. Many, many, many. You understand? There will be many. And then realize... Why did you think that? Wow, that's because... <laughs> experience? <laughs> yeah, a little experience, that's all. Uh, and then realize you don't marry just the person, you marry the family. You got that? You don't marry just that person. I mean, you are going to be with them on the 4th of July and Christmas and Thanksgiving. And all of the crazy things that they do in that family, your spouse is going to do all those crazy things. All right? 
I remember we get married. I mean, with the next morning, we go to the pancake house and Jeannie puts peanut butter on her pancakes. And I went, eh. Oh, what a weird thing to do. And then I tried it. And I've been doing it ever since. <laughs> and I, now her family, I mean, all vacations went camping. They went camping, 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 camping. So I remember a few years ago, and I just wasn't, you know, I wasn't all that big on the camping thing. And so... Uh, we're out in Colorado and we've got the kids. Well, we've got a couple of the kids. A couple of them are gone. You know, and we're laying there in this big tent. And uh, two of the kids were in the back of the car or the back of the van. And Jeannie and I are in this big tent all alone. And, and she says, just think of it. She says, pretty quick, the kids are going to be gone. And I said, and it'll just be you and I in the tent. And she said, and she said, it'll just be you and I in the tent. And I'm thinking, you and I in a nice hotel. <laughs> but, but to her to this day it's camping it's camping all right now listen find somebody who is financially stable all right girls that means they have a job all right find somebody with a job financially stable now, it, it may seem like well we love each other. And we, just go, we just love each other. You know, you need some love, but you need some money. <laughs> you understand? You need some money. Listen, 75% of divorces, the number one cause or the second contributing cause was financial stress. Now, if, if you do not handle your funds well as a couple, you will have difficulty, right? You'll have a hard time. So make sure that you find somebody who is financially stable. Okay, well, I had a point I missed somewhere. It was in there, but I wanted to throw it out. Didn't want to miss it. When he was reading from Ephesians about being tenderhearted, um, I just wanted to clarify, make sure that you understand the tenderhearted there is, doesn't mean someone who's easily offended, you know, like, real easily, like you say, oh, I'm just really tender and that hurt me and that hurt me. And you have someone who just gets hurt over everything, reads in, into whatever you do, is always interpreting it uh, the wrong way, takes offense at this and, and can't roll with a few things in life. You're going to have a very frustrated life. We're not saying you have to be perfect before you can, you're a candidate for marriage, but um, get to growing. Quit sitting in the ditch where you're at and making it, digging it deeper and, and um, learn and grow and let God change you. He says he changes us from glory to glory to glory. How good it is that we don't have to stay in our rut or in our, if you are an easily get angered person or easily get offended, um, get over it. Say, God, give me a, create me a clean heart. Um, make me more like you, Jesus. Let that be the cry of your heart. I surrender all to you today. Make me more like you. And he, he gives you the word and, and it will equip you with the good things you need to do it God's way and live God's way. And that's the way you can become more of the type of person that can really um, make marriage a wonderful thing. I I got to tell you that, um, you know, he, he kind of scares you and says, well, um, you know, don't, marriage doesn't make you happy. It's true if you're thinking that the man is going to make you happy. But when your fulfillment is in God and you get to live together with someone where you make a better team together, it is awesome. And God made marriage so it's his idea, and he really has a great, had a great idea. Marriage is awesome, but it is a challenge. It's an adventure, and it's really good, and it's worth it, and it works doing it God's way. And we just um, know that you can be encouraged to, to have that kind of relationship that God will have, and it is really, really worth it. You know, the foundation for every marriage needs to be a relationship with God. Because when you look at it, marriage was not just created by God for man. It was created when man was in the Garden of Eden in his state of innocence. It wasn't just Adam and Eve. It was God, Adam, and Eve. 
And for a marriage to be a great marriage, God needs to be a part of that marriage. He needs to be in the middle of it. You know, if you are trying to have a great marriage, but you're doing it without God, I, I want to tell you, you're not going to succeed. And today, if you're away from God, if you don't know where you stand with God, or if you simply say, God, I want to be right with you. I want to be forgiven. I want you to come into my life. I want you to rescue me and make me a new person. I want to invite you to pray this prayer of commitment and to give your life to God. Just say, oh God, I believe Jesus died on the cross. I believe his blood paid for my sins and I believe he rose again. I give him all of my heart and all of my life. I'm gonna live for him every day. I thank you, you've heard my prayer that I am forgiven, that I'm a part of your family, a part of your eternal kingdom in Jesus name. Amen. You know, if you prayed that from your heart, God heard that prayer. Now, you've just really passed from death to life. You've become, the Bible says, born again, a new creature. And what you need to do is keep on growing spiritually. I wrote a book to help you called Your New Life. I want to send it to you free of charge. It's full of bullet points to help you keep on growing spiritually. All you need to do is contact us. All the information is right there on your screen. At Walking by Faith, we have prayer partners standing by just waiting to pray with you. So if you just prayed with Pastor Dwayne, don't waste a moment. Please give us a call. I know that there are many of you who have been watching and you've been waiting for a good time to sow a seed into this ministry. Right now is that time. There is no better time to give than now. While your gift to Walking by Faith has always taken this program to our viewers, right now you can make a double difference. It can be a double blessing. An anonymous donor is offered to match dollar to dollar every dollar that you give up to a hundred thousand dollars. So if you give twenty-five dollars today, it's really fifty. If you give a hundred, it's two hundred or five hundred, it becomes a thousand. Whatever you're able to give will go a long ways towards ensuring that people in 170 nations will be able to hear the gospel, receive practical biblical teaching that will transform their lives. Won't you do something right now that will make a difference? Pick up your phone, go to the website. All the information that you need is right there on your screen. Would you send your best possible gift to make a double difference, a double blessing in the lives of people all over the world that are watching Walking by Faith? If you would like to purchase today's teaching, we have it available on DVD for $8 and CD for $6. Hardest time in your entire life to hear God is when you are single and you are thinking about getting married. It is the hardest time to hear God. To order, just call or visit walkingbyfaith.tv. Thank you for watching Walking by Faith. Walking by Faith is made possible in part by the generous gifts of our viewers. If you would like to contribute to reaching the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through this program, please contact us at Walking by Faith, 5120 Ivan Rest Avenue Southwest, Granville, Michigan, 49418.